1865. America was in tatters after the Civil War. Then, it built. Miles upon miles of railroad. Once divided by cannon and gunpowder, now we were bonded together by steel and steam. And soon, electricity and diesel. What took months to get across our vast landscape, now took days. We continued to construct and connect, becoming the example to the rest of the world. Today, we are the paragon of ultra-fast, high-tech bullet... <laughs> yeah, right. What a load of baloney. Here we are, the paragon of high-speed rail. <laughs> you know, it sure would have been a great ending. But why? Why did we do this to ourselves? I mean, other countries are zipping away in high-tech bullet trains at excess of 200 miles an hour. And yet, here we are. We're stuck here. Here. Started early and here. And, uh, yeah, here. But before we know the why, we need to know the who, what, when, where, and, you know, history. And if we know the past, we can know how we got to the present and can account for the future, the past, present, and future of the American train. Forgotten to mention. My name is Demetrius Vola, the guy who's going to be narrating this, and the founder of a group called the High Speed Rail America Club, based here in sunny Miami. This is where we do our research and application in Florida International University, the largest research university in the Southeast. But you know, none of this, nor Miami, nor even South Florida, would have existed if it weren't for railroad. Cities such as Chicago, Illinois, Los Angeles, California, Las Vegas, Nevada, and Atlanta, Georgia, all owe their existence to the railroad. But since we are based in Miami, we're going to take a look at the interesting history in store. And no one knows South Florida history better than renowned author, professor, and historian, Seth Bramson. Well, after the Civil War, the railroads were a mess. Because remember that in the South, almost all the railroads had been destroyed. And in the North, the, the pounding they took and the beating from so much traffic uh, had left them in pretty rough shape. So basically, you entered an era of almost complete railroad rebuilding following the Civil War. At that time, Florida was sparsely populated and was better known for its swamps and mosquitoes rather than beaches. It wasn't until years later that a company known as the Florida East Coast Railroad, or the FEC, formed under who would become the father of South Florida, Henry Morrison Flagler. The FEC really started with the purchase by Henry Flagler on December 31st, 1885 of the Jacksonville, St. Augustine, and Halifax River Railroad. With the construction of his hotels in St. Augustine, the Ponce de Leon, and the Alcazar, the problem was that his contractors, Mr. McGuire and Mr. McDonald, kept coming to him and telling him that they couldn't get their goods, they couldn't get the material. The railroad was a broken down, narrow gauge railroad. They had laid the ties directly on the sandy soil, so no roadbed. Uh, the equipment was old and outmoded. So Mr. Flagler, out of sheer frustration, purchased the Jacksonville, St. Augustine, and Halifax River Railroad on December 31st, 1885. And at that point, he was in the railroad business, but he had no intention uh, and no forethought of becoming a great railroad magnet. It was just that he bought the railroad so that he could get the goods, the construction material, across the St. John's River by uh, ferry, then onto his railroad and bring it down to St. Augustine. And that was the only reason that he bought the railroad. With the railroad to St. Augustine, Flagler could have just settled down and retired then and there. But quite the contrary, he kept building south. Granted, it wasn't Takiya and Rum driving Flagler and the FEC to build south towards Miami, but the economic opportunities that lay ahead. Well, it was basically a jungle, a wilderness. 
Uh, you had a little bit of civilization here. You had the Brickles, uh, William and Mary Brickle. Uh, you had William Gleason and his partner, William Hunt. It wasn't totally barren, but essentially there was really nothing here. Mrs. Tuttle and the Brickles had been pleading with Mr. Flagler to extend his railroad, but until the great freezes of December of 1894 and January and February of 1895, there was no reason to extend the railroad. And so he just didn't do anything, but with those freezes, uh, Mrs. Tuttle then uh, sent him a telegram, said the region around the shores of Biscayne Bay was untouched by the freezes, and asked him to come down and see. Well, he didn't see. He sent his two now famous in Florida history lieutenants, James Ingraham uh, and Joseph R. Parrott. They came down, they looked, they went back to him, they reported, they said, my God, it's incredible, untouched by the freezes. Then he sent Mrs. Tuttle a telegram. He said, Madam, what is it that you propose? She wrote back and she said, if you will extend your railroad to the shores of Biscayne Bay and build one of your great hotels, then in, in addition, and this is the key part, in addition to the lands already promised you by Mr. and Mrs. Brickle south of the river, I will give you half of my holdings north of the river, plus 50 acres for shops and yards. And with that, a contract was drawn up the contract was signed by all parties, and that's why the railroad was extended to the shores of Biscayne Bay. Thousands of passengers rolled down to Miami and other parts of Florida, and the population boomed. Many who stayed at Flagler's hotels decided to stay in Florida after all, and hospitality today remains the number one industry in Florida. Coincidentally, we happen to have a hospitality expert here at FIU, Dean Mike Hampton. Well, in the, in the history of Florida, of course, Flagler bringing the rail system down here started the hospitality industry in Florida, essentially, uh, although uh, there would be others that might contest that kind of positioning. He was responsible for building the icons in the state of Florida, one of those being the Breakers in Palm Beach, uh, and that continues to be a focal point for us. Flagler uh, really was totally responsible. Uh, he was responsible for the development of the east coast of Florida and uh, very simply the east coast of Florida is his monument. There is not a city or a county or a town on the east coast of Florida that does not have something named for Henry Flagler. The story of South Florida's rise isn't just exclusive to South Florida. When you look at every major city in the U.S., all of them share a similar story. Trains come in, create new jobs, infrastructure opportunities, and commerce. Trains play a central role in the creation of American cities. I mean, after all, Grand Central Station is central. And the pattern is national. Unfortunately, our story here also has a terrible turn. This is America's passenger train culture today and what remains is a ghost of a quote-unquote bygone era. The days when private railroad companies connected cities with great speed and luxury has reached a chapter to where now all intercity passenger rail routes are owned by one government company, Amtrak. Amtrak is the leftover of what remained that couldn't be abandoned uh, when the freight railroads um, were relieved of their passenger operation. In order to understand what's out there today, you have to understand a little bit about the history of how it got there. Um, the freight railroads were losing money. They were regulated railroads for freight rates. They couldn't make money. The passenger services for years um, by themselves were money losing and almost full collapse of the freight industry in the 1970s um, Congress enacted uh, this Amtrak Act, and it was President Nixon that actually signed it into uh, law. And what it did is it relieved the freight railroads of any responsibility for rail passenger service and maintained a very skeletal network of a few trains, and this service um, was transferred to the public. Well, it was really expected that in three or four years it would die completely and then 
passenger service would be a, a, a relic of a bygone era. Compared to other countries, Amtrak is a third world rail system in a first world country. Last year, it lost $227 million, and the time it took to travel isn't so hot. In 1939, the Silver Meteor train from Miami to New York used to take a total of 25 hours to complete the journey. And now, the best Amtrak has done in this era is 27 hours. However, the blame is not particularly on Amtrak. Well, high-speed rail is something that you see, unlike Europe, uh, America has been burdened since the very early 1930s with the conspiracy. The Supreme Court of the United States in 1952 found General Motors and the automotive industry, the tire and rubber companies, the gas and oil companies, and the road builders guilty of conspiracy. What were they conspiring to do? to destroy America's street and electric railways. You can look at the statistics that are published from the uh, US DOT on an annual basis. Um, we have killed between 35 and 40,000 people annually every year since about 1949 or 50 on our roadway network. That's a lot of people that have been killed in highway accidents. If you take a look at the railroad safety record for people traveling on trains, the percentage of people it starts with a decimal point and it's zero, 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 maybe a number. If you were to introduce a new system and say that we're gonna build this massive system and it's only gonna kill 40,000 people a year, people would run you out of the room, but yet, that's what we have built in, and we have accepted that as the price of our unbridled mobility by automobile. The economics of that, you'll just never beat. Uh, an A320 with 180 seats flying between here and Orlando is always going to be a cheaper economic solution than a bullet train where you've got to lay physical stuff down, where you got to, it's going to burn more oil, it's going to take more time. It's just never going to be a real great competitor to the airlines. And it isn't a great competitor even in Europe so much. Today, with growing populations and the younger generation skipping the automobile, the demand for train travel, particularly high-speed rail travel, as seen in Europe and Asia, is high. And even Amtrak passenger numbers are increasing. The infrastructure and speed, though, hasn't quite caught up to 21st century. I mean, it's been over 40 years since the creation of Amtrak, and their ridership is the highest that it's ever been. The problem that Amtrak has is lack of capital investment, and that's the key to any business. The infrastructure is collapsing, so you can't make an investment. Amtrak has no resources to be able to implement new services or partner with states or even private companies to develop new services. However, we can look back at one example of a country that was in a similar situation just like us 50 years ago. Now, sometime after World War II, Japan was absolutely shattered, but years after that, they actually came back up and the cities were being flocked with a whole bunch of people, so they needed to find a way to move them around in the cities. And with the upcoming 1964 Olympics, well, congestion wasn't really gonna help. So the way they figured it out, well, trains. The target speed of the first train was 200 kilometers an hour, which in American knees is 125 miles an hour. Well, with the help of engineers and architects from the design designers of World War II planes that the Japanese had, they were able to make the bullet train, which is why it looks sort of like an airplane. All right, so not only did the first train exceed the top target speed of 125 miles an hour, but also even passed it to 130 miles an hour. Now remember, we're talking about 50 years ago. <laughs> Great Scott. Now, the whole thing was met with a thunderous applause across Japan when it finally unveiled in October of 1964, right in time for the Olympics. And they even had a little contest to name the train. And the name they chose, well, it hit the whole entire thing of the time and it was called Hikari, which in Japanese means light. Today, Japan has the premier network of high-speed rail in the world, with glimmery trains reaching speeds of over 200 miles an hour and 2,000 miles of track. 
and they're not done, not by a long shot. With even more miles on the way, and a magnetically levitating train capable of over 375 miles an hour. One company here in Florida is already making strides to take America into the high-speed age and connecting Miami and Orlando. Yes, it's about time. And it happens to be the direct descendant of Henry Flagler's line. It's called All Aboard Florida. Uh, one thing that we were able to hear or able to hear is do something what a lot of people don't believe can be done anymore. After the old railroads like Pennsylvania Railroad, the Erie Lackawanna to shut down, there was this concept in the United States that there cannot be a privately run railroad that, that is actually successful. And you know, I'm here to prove that wrong. Every time I tell people about it, they say, I, I can't believe it's taken so long, or they say, finally, right now I have a grandmother in Orlando, I go to see her every week, it takes me four, five hours to get there on the turnpike. I mean, you have all of these reasons why people hate traveling in this state right now. Once you're on a high-speed train, uh, you totally get it. I mean, that's just it. You just like, why don't we have this in this country? It's just such a, uh, you know, privilege to be able to sit back, relax in a comfortable environment, move at a high speed, enjoy the scenery, do Wi-Fi work, you know, do work literally. Uh, it's just a, a whole different experience and that's what we need in this country is for people to see that and feel it and understand and get it. The unique feature of the All Aboard Florida service is that you are leveraging private investment to deliver something that the public sector has not been able to do. And I do believe that this is a concept that's going to be replicated elsewhere. All Aboard Florida is the most exciting uh, passenger train initiative almost in American history. Most people that live in this area recognizing the traffic jams and the challenges that we have of just getting around here in the local area would find it to be something that could be very helpful in many ways to make our lives a little bit better. So there's many people who joined up with all of our floor, including myself, who left the areas that they were at because we believe in the vision. We believe it can be done. We know that this is the right kind of market for it. Anyone who travels these roads out here, myself including, you know, on a rush hour basis, knows how long it takes to get out of Miami, how long it takes to get to New York, the traffic you get around West Palm and Fort Lauderdale. So this is an environment that's perfect for the type of service that we're looking to provide. So for Florida, it is surprising to me that this hasn't happened yet. Um, I think I mentioned that we're working <laughs> in Florida as much as 20 years ago to try and bring a, a modern rail service to Florida. And for a variety of reasons that hasn't happened, but I do believe that we are at a dawning, if you will, of a whole new concept for intercity passenger rail service. I'm not trying to get rid of the car. There is the role for car in everybody's lives. I will keep mine, um, but we need to offer a menu of options to residents here. Well, like anything else, you want to make it safe, you want to make it efficient, you want to make it affordable. Those are all three things that we can do here. Number one, safety, that's, you're far safer on the train and that's statistically proven than you'll ever be on the roads around here. Uh, certainly it's more economic than you know, trying to drive between these far longer vacations. For instance, uh, if you're going to Miami and Orlando, which many people do, and I do so from my position, um, there's an extensive amount of uh, traffic and tolls, wear and tear on your auto automobile that you'll go through. It's also the aggravation, you know, and, and the other environmental factors as you're driving. Um, again, you get to the airport, which is usually on the outside of a city somewhere, and you'll wait two hours, you'll board your plane, hopefully without any delays, you know, weather or otherwise. On our train, you go from city center right to where we want to be. So be it Fort Lauderdale, be it West Palm, be it Orlando. It takes you there quickly without the aggravating waits and really in style. It makes a destination much more attractive because when people have convenience of access, they're more prone to make the decision to utilize that destination. And so when you look at the the attributes of Florida, Tampa, Orlando, Miami, getting individuals from one location to the other, it's better to have more options than not, uh, particularly for here. Uh, access by air is limited, so most people have to go by car. And if you had a high-speed rail system that could get them there in a short amount of time, it certainly would be a very attractive means. We're really a series of tourist markets. We aren't really a, a tourist market as a whole state. This project and the corollaries to it and all the, the possible extensions of it create the ability to have Florida be a travel destination 
not just Miami, not just a series of these little stops. This is the first Tier 4 compliant diesel locomotive that's going to be running. And what that is is Tier 4 is the EPA standards. So normally you have uh, what we call nitrous oxides, which is one of the primary uh, diesel pollutants when you burn diesel fuel. Uh, our system, for the Tier 4 system, actually uses a diesel emission fluid on the after treatment in the exhaust, and it converts that, those nitrous oxides to nitrogen gas and water. So this is going to be the cleanest engine that exists. So that's you know, a few of the things that are unique, and certainly, again, our speed 125 for a diesel locomotive is not commonly seen in the United States. When I was growing up, the biggest thing we wanted was we, we couldn't wait to get a car. That's not so important for you guys anymore. Frankly, you're a lot more environmentally oriented than, than we were. You're way more environmentally conscious. You're way more um, urbanistic. You want to be in the dense urban areas and be able to walk and get on a bike and then get on the train and uh, travel environmentally conscious, um, efficient, fast way where you can be connected and not worrying about um, getting into an accident. So this is like very much speaking to your generation. I lived in Europe for almost six years um, and have been on the high-speed trains, English Channel Tunnel Train, the Eurostar, the TGV, the Thales Train. Europe is building an entire network that's interconnected to bring the countries together as well as reduce travel times. It's, uh, it's really pretty amazing. Well, the Japanese <clears throat> were just ahead of the rest of the world, and the rest of the world then followed. Um, the uh, Takedo Express and, as you said, the Shinkansen system, uh, it, it was, it was earth-shattering, it was groundbreaking. And what we're doing with All Aboard Florida is as earth-shattering and groundbreaking in this country. You know, it's, it's going to be something that the people can be proud of, not just the people who are involved with it, but the people of Florida. This is their product, this is something that they can use, something that they're not paying for, quite honestly, it's not taxpayer uh, subsidized. You know, so this is something that's going to be make life a lot easier for a lot of people. No doubt, the benefits will be enormous. And what can we look forward to for the rest of the country? The three largest states in the country are now California, Texas, and Florida. And all three just happen to coincidentally be working on high-speed passenger projects. The first to be completed will be here in Florida in 2017, connecting South and Central Florida at 125 miles an hour, expecting to bring over $10 billion in revenue to the entire state and over 10,000 jobs. In Texas, Dallas and Houston will be connected by the Texas Central Railway Company, a private company who is working together with the Central Japan Railway Company in order to bring the 200 mile an hour N700 Nozomi Shinkansen. The project promises to bring the first true high-speed rail initiative in the United States. In California, by far the most controversial project is the California High Speed Rail Authority, a $68 billion project funded by the state and federal government. In the Northeast, a company known as the Northeast Maglev proposes to connect Washington DC and New York City in less than one hour apart through the use of Japan's superconducting Maglev train. Pennsylvania has just recently begun to follow the lead of all aboard Florida and creating a group called All Aboard Erie to connect northern and central Pennsylvania through high-speed rail. As the younger people are beginning to go around the rest of the world and see what's out there and says, my God, how can they do this? And we were the leaders in everything until the 1950s or 60s. And we've got a relic of a transportation system while the rest of the world has gone space age. That's being communicated back with the population base that we are experiencing in this country, and especially in the big states like California, Texas, Florida, and the Northeast, um, we're not going to be able to handle the travel for all the people who are going to live here without it. I think Flagler was a visionary, and certainly we need other visionaries that can help us in how we keep moving forward and building the best next thing for our visitors to be able to experience. We're talking about uh, 200 mile an hour passenger trains, but you can't do that unless you've got the distance, and we've got the distance in this country. We should absolutely positively have trains operating at 200 and 250 miles an hour between Chicago and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Seattle and Portland and San Diego. The whole idea of high-speed rail is something that we're only 50 years behind on in this country. 
It's something that should have started 50 years ago. You know that there are places like this all across the country where you can take two different city pairs and link them. And that's the future of rail in this country. The new era of a revolution has begun. Imagine a new era in which the country is not divided by bigotry, but bonded through steel, connected through only a short time apart. Imagine a clean and environmental friendly mode of transportation, faster than a car and more convenient than an airport. Imagine being thrust into a new economic era where we can build great things again, like a transcontinental railroad or an overseas railroad. The question we give to you is this. Are you on board the American train?